or what can you do if the Migration Review Tribunal also refuses your application or doesn't waive the um, criterion? An appeal to the Federal Circuit Court um, can be made, but only where there are reasonable grounds. So a lawyer can only make such an application on behalf of an applicant uh, if there are reasonable grounds for um, considering that there are reasonable prospects for success of that application. An applicant could do that um, in their own right, um, but they are very technical cases. Um, the court is not a merits review body. They're not going to hear fresh evidence. They're not going to weigh up the evidence. They're only going to assess whether um, there's been a particular type of what's called jurisdictional error, that it might be an error of pr procedure, so a lack of procedural fairness. It might be a misapplication of the law. It might be a failure to take into account a, a relevant and important consideration. Can you outline um, some examples of errors in law or errors in procedure? Um, there are quite a number involving inadequate you know, interpreting services, um, a tribunal member perhaps being biased, so a reasonable apprehension of bias. We've had quite a few of those come through the courts. Those tend to be the main ones in terms of um, fairness, so the, the obligation to provide natural justice um, and the obligation to provide a hearing that is fair. Um, in terms of uh, the application of the law, we're seeing a lot of the PIC 4020 cases really just teasing out what it means, the language of the provision itself. So you might find that in this area it's, um, there's still a lot that's been left undecided by the courts because it is such a, a complex provision. Dinesh, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, as uh, mentioned, it is still developing, evolving, so to speak. Uh, but it is important that any applicant who receives a document, an invitation to comment uh, from the department or at, a, uh, at the Migration Review Tribunal, uh, to take it seriously, to uh, put attention to the matter. Uh, and because sometimes people think that we could go to the tribunal and just write a letter and the matter will be over. Uh, no, it's much more serious than that. Sometimes un it's an unfortunate situation. We see the tribunal takes the same sort of line of questioning and attitudes and assumptions uh, which can be later on considered as preconceived biasness uh, similar to the tribunal. So a professional needs to identify if justice is not given by the tribunal to identify errors of law uh, to approach the court system. So if at the end of the court process there's still no success, what other options are there? I guess you need to really think hard about it because court system uh, is uh, fairly uh, neutral, uh, very well trained. Uh, com we cannot compare the training of uh, the, the lawyers and the judges to the training that is given uh, to members of the department or the, the, the tribunal, um, but still uh, if you think that justice is not given, uh, you can appeal to a higher court. Yes, then is Karen, could you uh, tell me about the consequences of the um, misleading or false information to the Department of Immigration, please? So it's very difficult sometimes to um, determine um, whether it was in fact intentionally provided. There is a case um, called Trevetti that's now gone to the full court which says something along the lines of that the material must have been purposely untrue, at least at some point along in the chain. So if your migration agent intended the information to be false, the fact that you didn't know that it was false or that it had even been provided um, is not um, an answer to that. So there is this notion that a typographical error is not uh, a problem, is not caught, um, but where that line lies in a particular case is quite a nuanced one and one that really you need to take the department through. They will also look in the discretion when they're um, looking at the waiver at the nature and extent of the fraud. So there is some degree of weighing up of the nature and extent of the fraud vis-a-vis -vis, you know, the applicant's personal circumstances and the impact on an Australian citizen or permanent resident. You've mentioned some of the typographical um, errors. How far does that go? I mean, it could be one word, could it be a sentence? Well, the, the ones that would be relevant to a visa would be ones that affect a person's age. Um, so if a visa criterion is that you are under 50 and you are in fact over 50, but you provide um, a, 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 false, over, a false over, age, yes. um, 
but those would require bogus documents as well to establish. So it's, it's unusual that a typo wouldn't al also, that is relevant to a, a visa criterion, wouldn't also be accompanied by So it by sounds like there's a lot of weighing document. up. You need to provide um, certain things and if you mm. can show that it was in the age instance that it was just a typo, it was just that once mm. and you've got all these other documents showing your correct age. You should be, be careful, though there have been refusals in, not in relation to 4020 where a person could not put your unit number, their unit number in the address, in a, not uh, an application form but a form called uh, Form 80 and the department did refuse the application and even uh, the tribunal refused the application and the court refused the application if you have, you have not particularly identified yourself and the address so you have to be nevertheless have to be very careful and thorough uh, check of the application must be undertaken before submission. Yes I think it certainly does raise the issue that you need to be very cautious about preparing an application and not rely on other people to do so but to check um, that the information you have provided has accurately been recorded. It also brings me to the other limb of the public interest criteria in the 10-year ban so there is a, a sub set within the public interest criteria which relates to establishing a person's identity and that is a 10-year ban that does not have any waiver. So if an applicant cannot to the department's satisfaction establish who they are, their age, um, uh, then the, the visa could not only be refused but also a 10-year ban and that, that's a particularly harsh um, uh, limb of the public interest criterion because there are certain countries as you will know like Afghanistan and many around the, the world that simply don't have terribly good record keeping and it's extremely difficult for applicants um, to provide a birth certificate such basic documents as a birth certificate and we're finding that. So uh, what can they do if, if they don't have certain documents um, to show the department that they are who they are. We're having to think very laterally on this one and provide statutory declarations by people who are present at the birth, you know, at the house, in the village, um, to say, I saw that child being born, it's my nephew, it's my niece, I saw that child grow up. Um, but it, it ends up being, um, you know, a declaration, a simple statement, but it's a sworn statement and it's sometimes the best and only evidence that an applicant can provide because any other evidence, later evidence, has been based on self-report. So right. there was no contemporaneous birth record made. Um, it's only at the time that a person applies for a visa that they need to suddenly produce identity documents. And so the department says, well, we're not convinced that that's a true identity document because it's just based on your say-so. Mm. Um, before we go, what would you recommend um, any visa applicants do in this situation? I think really go through the letter very carefully, have a look at the allegation that's been put, see a lawyer at least for preliminary advice to see and understand uh, what might be said in your defence and what options are available in terms of alternate visas. It may be possible to withdraw the visa application and apply for an alternate visa. Um, there may be a number of other strategies over and above simply meeting uh, or trying to address the allegation. And Dinesh, do you have anything final that you want to add? Uh, yes, 4020 is a, uh, uh, the repercussions of a refusal on a 4020 is uh, serious. Not only a visa refusal, not only a ban, a potential uh, action by the Director of Public Prosecution. Uh, so you must take it seriously and uh, you must, uh, in my opinion, seek professional legal advice and let uh, a legal advisor exercise their skills, experience and judgment to advise you. Uh, so that's my um, advice in summary. And Vimala, um, you've asked some really interesting questions. As a student, um, do you have anything that you'd like to comment on? Actually, these public interest criteria for T20 is very important and even in our study. And uh, I'm sure that it would be interesting if um, everyone understand about how to present the documents to the uh, department. Of course, they need the real documents and uh, as a citizen or as a future citizen, we should provide all the correct information to the department. I'd like to thank you all for joining our panel tonight. You've been very informative. For more information, please go to our website lawhelpaustralia.org and you can also catch up on our previous episodes on our YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us.